Good morning. So good to be back here. Welcome to Open Source Summit Europe 2024. Um, we're excited to be here. Uh, we have so many people registered for the conference, but most importantly, I want to thank you um, for making it here. The weather has been crazy. Um, so thank you so much. It's so great to see so many people here. Uh, now, I realize, talking about the weather, that uh, as an Italian living in California, I'm pretty spoiled. But I think we can all agree um, it's a bit unseasonal here uh, right now. So thank you so much for putting the effort and being here. Um, now, before we move into some housekeeping, um, I want to turn to, um, you know, I want to ask you for, uh, for your patience. I might be a little rusty. Um, some of you might know I just came back from my paternity leave, um, where <laughs> we welcomed our four months old, uh, uh, our second kid uh, ever. So I'm, again, I'm probably going to be rusty. And, as I was preparing the, the keynote, um, I really pondered, should, should I put my kid's picture? Is it a little bit too self-centered? And turns out I became one of those dads that, you know, in the first minute of the conversation is going to show you their baby picture. Um, so uh, I certainly welcome you if you meet me uh, uh, in the hallway track. Please come and introduce yourself. Would love to hear from you. Would love to talk to you. But please be prepared to a load of baby pictures, uh, because that's all I can talk about right now. So now, uh, some housekeeping items. Um, uh, first and foremost, we have a networking app. I suggest you download. Uh, just search for Life Events on the App Store. Um, not only you can make connections there, uh, but it also has the schedule, the map of the exhibits, uh, and more. Um, the link to the app, the conference schedule, and the wife of information are on your badge and on the signage around the hall, uh, around the venue. Uh, and please make sure, as usual, uh, remember we have an event code of conduct. If you have any issues, please talk to the event staff at registration or in the information desks. This year, uh, we're serving lunch. Hopefully, that will give you more time to uh, uh, network. And in the hallway track, uh, it will be served in the solution showcase, which opens daily at the end of the keynotes. Um, this is also where you find coffee breaks, lounge areas, activities, our job board, and when you can meet our sponsors and find out about new technologies, projects, and more. Um, Make sure you stay around. Uh, this is where we're going to have also our reception tonight, the tax track, uh, which begins at 5 PM. Now, a couple of activities that I want to highlight and encourage you to participate in. Um, after lunch, we're going to have a speed networking event, which can help you meet attendees and expand your network. Uh, as every year, we're also offering the ask, ask the Expert sessions, um, which is a great chance to talk one-on-one -on -one with longtime community leaders uh, in a variety of subject matter areas. Um, today's session starts at 2.55. Uh, make sure you check your SCAD uh, for timing. Finally, uh, we have an unconference sessions uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, you can sign up to lead one of these or join one that looks interesting. This is certainly one of my favorite uh, parts of the event. Uh, the sign-up board is in the solution showcase, and sessions will be added on SCAD on an ongoing basis. After the keynotes, every day, stick around for a new raffle. I'm going to have a raffle today, first time for me. Uh, so stick around. You should have received a raffle ticket when you walked in. Uh, hold on and you must be present to win. In case you're wondering what the prizes are, they're up on stage. Um, unfortunately, I will not be participating to the raffle, but I wish you the best of luck. And then finally, before we get started with the content, I uh, uh, want to thank our program committee. Uh, um, uh, we would not be here, and the program would not be as amazing without your support. Please join me to give them a big round of applause.
Finally, uh, a huge thank you to our Diamond sponsors. Uh, I want to thank Google, Hedera, oops, <laughs> Microsoft, and Open Atom of Open Euler, uh, um, as well as our Platinum sponsors, Huawei, Open Search, and Wind River. Once again, uh, this conference will not be possible without your support, so thank you so much. Now, with the housekeeping behind us, uh, let's get into what I hope is going to be an exciting day and, and week of content. Um, so in this opening keynote, I uh, would like to focus on a topic that I think it's often overlooked or taken for granted, uh, but I argue is at the very core of uh, open source projects, especially uh, those who become mature and make an impact uh, globally, and that's trust. I mean, we're all familiar with the need for trust and, and sort of the inherent trust uh, in open source. Um, but I'd like to talk today about how trust is necessary on so many levels uh, as a fundamental ingredient to bring uh, an open source project to you know, the maturity we see in the likes of Linux, Kubernetes, PyTorch, and so many of the other projects that the whole world relies on. But to set the stage, uh, I think it's important sort of to look back at what has been truly another momentous year for open source. Um, I think if you are a first time attendee, uh, I hope in the next 50 minutes you get an idea how far the movement has come and how the community is coming together to address some of the key challenges uh, open source faces. Uh, but for those of you who have been, who've been part of open source projects, been contributing for the longest time, well, uh, you know, I'm sure you feel how every year the impact of open source uh, keeps growing. And frankly, I think you should be proud uh, of what you did to help making it sort of this mature engine, not just for technology, but also for economic and social betterment uh, that has become today. So let me give you a couple of examples to put this in perspective. Um, again, I think if you're in this room, you're bought in uh, on the technical value of open source. Um, there would simply be, you know, the, the technology stack as we know it would simply not be there without open source. Um, but over the last few years, you know, and particularly accelerated with the AI revolution in the last year, open source has been regularly talked about in terms of its impact on global economic development, market dynamics, geopolitics. I mean, it didn't used to be every day uh, that you have an article on the Wall Street Journal discussing how open source is fueling a global, but certainly very European-centric uh, ecosystem in a new area of technology like AI. And you know, it doesn't stop there. Um, open source has been recognized for, again, its social value. Um, and so you see, you know, entities like the World Economic Forum uh, publishing a, a thought piece on how open source plays a hugely critical role on responsible AI development. It's not your typical tech publication, right? And, you know, I would be remiss not to mention something that happened earlier this year in New York. The United Nations hosted a conference called Open Source OSPO for Good, uh, really focusing on uh, the notion of open source as a digital public good and what it can do uh, to fighting, you know, to supporting uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, tomorrow we have Omar from the United Nations on stage. Uh, I think this is very inspiring. Uh, and just to give you a sort of practical example, you know, this is sort of near and dear to my heart as with my other hat I run the FinTech Open Source Foundation. Earlier this year we merged with a project called OS Climate. Uh, which is a little foundation project working on enabling sustainability-aligned investing. So now we have some of the largest financial institutions in the world uh, working on open source, uh, one of the most conservative industries, really trying to effectively address um, climate change. I mean, this is something that when I started in, in this world, uh, I wouldn't even hope. Uh, but you don't have to trust 
uh, an Italian. You know, I, it's hard. I get it. Um, uh, when I tell you that you know, open source has reached sort of unprecedented levels of maturity. Uh, today, uh, Linux Foundation Europe and Linux Foundation Research are unveiling our third uh, annual World of Open Source report, uh, specifically focused on Europe, which clearly tells us that we are at the watershed moment for open source here. Um, in the next slide and throughout the presentation, I'll share some of the highlights. Uh, but make sure you download the report. I see some of you pointing at the QR code. Uh, and make sure you join the panel later today if you want to get in depth of the findings of this report. So why did I bring this up? Um, because especially here in Europe, uh, the report tells us that open source is uh, fully recognized as a piece of critical infrastructure. Um, but also that some of these sort of old myths like security uh, continues to be dispelled. Um, so it should be no surprise open source has become such a big focus in Europe uh, of EU investments for the last several years, and we hope and are confident it will continue uh, with the new legislation. But as always, you know, with great power, um, I guess great value, uh, comes great responsibility. Um, every time, this has been cycles, uh, every time that open source grows in its maturity and its impact, it's bound to face new challenges. Um, you know, whether it be regulatory challenges, uh, especially in the EU, we are effectively entering a new era of open source regulation, of software regulation, um, with the CRA, the AI Act. Uh, we'll talk about it extensively throughout the week. Um, whether it be novel uh, attacks, like the XZ attack that happened earlier this year, um, which really, through new vectors, highlights uh, you know, further the need for open source sustainability and raises very important questions around you know, the identity of, of maintainers. Um, whether in the midst of the AI wave, and we'll talk about it later today, um, there's a growing number of companies that willingly or unwillingly um, are attaching the open source label to their open, openly available uh, large language models, um, commonly referred as open washing. Or whether it be the growing trend uh, of vendors that we've seen over the last two years switching their license uh, on established open source projects. Um, something that the community colloquially refers as rug pull. Um, so, you know, as open source matures, new challenges arise. Um, and that's where I go back to trust. Um, of course, the technical value and sort of the project market fit are a very, you know, are the basic ingredient for an open source project to succeed. Uh, but I argue that open source wouldn't be here if it was for another uh, fundamental ingredient. And that ingredient is trust. Um, as we said, trust is inherently built in open source code. But what I hope to share with you today, uh, also as we look uh, at our keynote speakers, is the so many levels that are required uh, for a project um, in terms of trust for a project to take off and become mature and have an impact on the global scale. And hopefully to understand how the Linux Foundation has helped so many of these projects get mass adoption and mass contribution. By the way, in case you're wondering, um, that article uh, from Red Monk uh, came out on Friday, very much as I was preparing this keynote on trust. And you know, what a better timing. It's a great article. I would very much recommend uh, reading it. Now, let's start with these levels of trust. Uh, I think the most basic level of trust um, that a foundation can provide uh, around projects is, is you know, IP stewardship, stewardship and compliance, uh, making sure that a project uses and complies with open source licenses, that patent and trademarks are properly managed and neutrally owned. Now, as a developer, this <laughs> You know, 10 years ago, it was a very esoteric concept for me. Um, but as I joined the magic world of foundations, it became absolutely clear 
how it creates the necessary trust for not just individuals, but especially large enterprises to confidently adopt open source. Um, you know, I, with my other hat, I run uh, Finos, uh, the, the, you know, bringing some of the most conservative regulated industries to work in open source. Uh, it would simply not be possible without the level of assurance. Uh, let me give you a couple of examples here. Um, I'm assuming you're familiar with patent trolls, uh, uh, more uh, properly known as non-practicing entities. Uh, the attacks on both open source software and proprietary software built on open source are on the rise. So the Linux Foundation five years ago, together with Microsoft, the Open Invention Network, co-founded the Unified Patents Open Source Zone. Uh, our goal was really to hinder MPs' patent attacks on open source software. And so today, as we continue to proactively support our projects in stewardship and compliance of their IP, uh, I'm really excited to share the Unified Patents is announcing uh, that it will extend several benefits to the Linux Foundation and CNCF members. Um, take a look at the announcement, the QR code is there, and if you're a member, make sure that you take advantage of these benefits. Uh, patent trolls are a reality uh, to, to be dealt with, and this is one of the ways uh, we're trying to help your project and your organizations uh, hinder that. Now, another example, uh, uh, you know, I would be remiss not to mention the Cyber Resilience Act. Um, can I get a show of hands? How many of you are familiar with the CRA? Quite a good number. Um, just quickly, if you're not familiar with it, it's a new regulation, got passed this year. It's going to be adopted over time over the next few years. And the goal is to bolster cybersecurity, uh, but it does impose new compliance requirements on software shipped in the EU. Uh, and while open source has been not only prominently mentioned in the regulation, it's one of the first times, uh, and enjoys certain exception. Um, also, thanks to your advocacy and the advocacy of many foundations out there, um, this is something all open source developers and companies building on open source need to be familiar with. So unsurprisingly, while the law has not come into force yet, um, you know, our reports shows uh, the folks are confused, are uncertain, it's creating headaches. And so the Linux Foundation and the Linux Foundation Europe are actively engaging, uh, first and foremost, with lawmakers um, to influence the standardization process. Um, we're working with our projects, like the Open Source Security Foundation, SPDX, and Open Chain, to provide tools for our projects to seamlessly comply with the regulation. Uh, and of course, we're working on research and education to make sure that you are uh, well informed, not only as a maintainer, but also as a business building on open source. Um, we'd love to hear your feedback this week, as this is going to be a multi-year process. Uh, so please come by to our booth and understand, you know, help us understand how we can help you, whether you are a maintainer in one of projects or whether, whether you are a company building on open source. Now, let's switch gears. I'm going to go to the sort of next two levels of trust, which I think they go really hand in hand. Um, Having an open source project stewarded by a foundation means uh, that there's very little chance that the project will change its license over time. And if that happens, uh, it will be because of the consensus decisions of the governing bodies of the project, certainly not the decision of a single vendor. So effectively, this allows open source to stay open forever. Which brings me to my next point, which again goes very much hand in hand, uh, and it's what most people refer to as open governance. Um, effectively, open governance is a transparent layer on top of open source um, that allows, on the basis of meritocracy and, and sort of transparent governing process, to make decisions. Um, and not only we provide uh, uh, you know, templates for open governance for projects, but we enforce it, meaning we make sure that both small, large corporations, individuals have a level playing field when it comes to making decisions on a project. I don't think uh, most people realize that. You know, 
an open source license, as we've learned uh, over the last couple of years, is not enough. Uh, but let me give you a couple of examples. Um, so earlier this year, the Linux Foundation launched a project called Valky. Uh, you probably are familiar with it. Uh, it started as a fork of Redis, uh, the popular in-memory data store. Uh, once the company behind it decided to change the license to a non-open source license, that obviously created a major havoc on consumers. Uh, they had to scramble with a project that was no longer open source. Uh, it took a week after the fork to launch the project. And the project received immediate support from some large organizations like AWS, Google Cloud, Oracle, Ericsson, and Snap, amongst others. So today, uh, uh, we're very excited to announce uh, the 8.0 release of Valky, which really shows um, the rapid innovation uh, and significant updates to the project. You know, a community came together very quickly uh, after the fork, and this release really enhances the foundation uh, and based on the strength of Redis, uh, while introducing new features that really elevate and differentiate Valky. Um, in the last year, the community uh, you know, focused on you know, really building a better Redis while building the community at the same time. Not an easy fit. Um, you've seen some amazing stats up there in terms of improvements both in throughput, uh, memory efficiency, in just six months. Uh, and this is in part because of the, you know, the community was able to thrive and grow uh, because of the trust, because they could make a long-term investment on the project. And so don't miss this week the opportunity to get involved. Uh, there's both sessions today and tomorrow, uh, as well as Valky Developer Day on Thursday. Uh, and I'll leave the QR code a couple of seconds more, but check out the Valky uh, 8.0 announcement. This has been very exciting. Now, as I said, this is a level playing field. It's not just about the hyperscalers of large enterprises. Uh, last year, on this very same stage, we announced OpenTofu, uh, a fork of HashiCorp's Terraform, once again, following the license change. Um, following the announcement, the project is now supported by over 160 organizations, and these are smaller organizations and individuals. Uh, this is not the, your typical hyperscalers. Uh, I think this is a big testament, going back to the idea of a level playing field. Uh, you know. Uh, this is not just a testament to the right to fork that is typical to every open source project, but really to the trust that open governance provides uh, above and beyond uh, what our open source licenses already gives us. Um, and on this note, I want to bring our first speaker up uh, for a special announcement. I'm delighted to welcome Nandini Ramani. Uh, she's the Vice President of Search and Cloud Operations at Amazon Web Services. Nandini, please welcome on the stage. Thank welcome. you, Gabrielli. Thanks, everyone. It's super exciting to be here today. Um, and I do have a special announcement, but I want to start off by introducing myself. So I'm responsible for uh, search and cloud operations at AWS, and I've been a Fan, not only a fan, but also an active participant in open source, um, you know, projects. So I used to run Java for those of you who use and use it and are familiar with it. So being a big fan was instrumental in open sourcing Java. Have participated in the W3C as part of the programs and chaired the SVG working group. So it's great to be back with the open source community as part of Open Search. Um, and so let's kick it off by talking a little bit about uh, open search, which is what I'm actually here to talk about. So AWS created and started a project called Open Search, which, and I want to talk about how it grew based on the community of uh, developers, software developers, and enthusiasts who not only kicked off the project but continue to really foster the growth of the search community and help us innovate on this great search and uh, analytics platform. So when you think about AWS, most people think of AWS as fabulous infrastructure to run your open source uh, 
projects on. And that is still true, by the way. It is a great infrastructure to run your open source um, projects on. However, I'm here to tell you that we are way, way more than that. And over the past several years at AWS, we have really doubled down on our investment in open source um, communities and fostering growth, et cetera. And we, it's getting noticed by partners, customers, and the uh, open source community altogether. In fact, we have incubated several projects, including uh, Open Search, obviously, and then Bottle Rocket, Free RTOS, there's several of them here that you can see on your screen, Babelfish for PostgreSQL, and much, much more. We have also contributed, and you heard Gabrielli talk about Valky, we've done that. We have uh, Linux, uh, OpenJDK as well, Open Telemetry, lots of several different projects that we are part of. We've also created within AWS the Open Source Program Office, which helps us found, uh, grounded in our founding principles of open source, and, and then it also helps us think through before we participate in projects so that we ensure you know, we want it to be secure, enterprise ready, et cetera. So AWS created Open Search a little over three years ago, and the intent was to offer the only open source search platform that is secure, enterprise ready, and innovate, innovative for the long term horizon. And most importantly, it's free to use and resell forever. These guiding principles that you see behind me on the screen here are still true today and have powered us forward in everything we do around the projects. Now, open, source, uh, open Search thrived based on these founding principles, as you can see, and we've seen tremendous growth over the last several years with the community participation on these projects. We've seen an acceleration in new features and functionality, and in fact, since uh, July 2021, we've had two major releases and 19 minor releases. And we are really super proud and consider this a very successful vendor-sponsored open source project. Now, open search quickly grew and became one of AWS's largest open, search, uh, open source project. Getting the two open source and search mixed up. Um, and this is a first for us, by the way. We have, in fact, launched independent brand books. We publish our roadmaps um, on GitHub. Um, and then we've launched also social channels, a website. And then we're also holding public triage meetings for both code, security, and other topics. And then here's another one. We've created a public Slack channel so that the community can actually collaborate and do things together. And by the way, this is a big departure for AWS, from the norm at AWS. We've really learned how to compromise and collaborate with the community, not because it's the easy thing to do, but because it's the right thing to do. And the results are consistently high interest and growth from uh, innovation, contributions, et cetera. In fact, our views on our digital um, destinations have accelerated and we see a lot of growth. And prolific con contributors have become maintainers. And in fact, today, double digit percentage of uh, maintainers on open search are not working at AWS. I know it's a little bit of a vanity metric, but I think it really tells you how invested we are in open search. And uh, the project downloads have never stopped. In fact, they've continued month over month. And in the last three months alone, the number of downloads has far exceeded any three month period prior. Also, as of today, we've had 700 million downloads of open search. And this is the outcome when the community gets together, stays anchored on the founding principles, which I heard Gabrielli and others talk about, and really fostered innovation within this project. So as you can tell, we at AWS are super proud of open search and everything that we have done for the community. And yet, 
Right from the start, the question kept popping up. Wouldn't it be better if this were in a nonprofit or at least sponsored by a neutral uh, nonprofit? And at AWS, we always listen to our customers. So, in fact, at OpenSearchCon in 2023, September of last year, we spent about half of our annual partner roundtable discussing this very topic. Two things came about. One, open search is a very successful open source project. And two, it would benefit from moving to a more vendor neutral um, nonprofit. So we listened, and soon we assembled a group of multi different companies coming together, a combination of contributors, maintainers, partners, and customers all came together, formed a re referendum and a steering co leadership committee to discuss what the charter of this new vendor neutral project could look like. The first meeting was a referendum where we discussed whether it should be transitioned. And then subsequent meetings spun off uh, topics like operations, technical um, topics, etc. So the result of which, this continued all the way through to this year, by the way. We're still continuing to spin up um, conversations, and we're still living up to the commitment that you saw previously on the slide behind me on the founding principles of everything we believe in uh, to create a secure, enterprise-ready, innovative search and analytics platform that can be run, owned by the community. <clears throat> So with this commitment to the open source community, I am delighted to announce today the Open Search Software Foundation, which is the newest project of the Linux Foundation. <laughs> Honestly, the Linux Foundation was an easy choice for us. Uh, Linux Foundation is known for how they manage complex distributed um, projects in open source and have built a vibrant community around it. So it was an easy choice for us. And they are also trusted by global leaders as the leading open source platform and uh, foundation. And most importantly, the Linux Foundation shares our commitment to everything we believe in in open source. And working hand in hand with the community. This move brings a lot of positive outcomes with it because it's part of now a neutral foundation that will allow more types of organizations to participate and get involved in open search. We have created a new governing body, uh, a board, uh, and a technical steering committee as well. In fact, I think Slack, uh, Uber, and um, ByteDance and others are part of it, so we're super excited for this. And we're going to drive this as an open governance for both digital, uh, sorry, technical and operation, uh, operations topics. And the benefit of this is Linux Foundation's enablement programs will help us formalize and deliver in areas such as like product training and certification programs, et cetera. So stay tuned for more of that. And organizations have already joined us. As you can see behind me, several logos of self-managed, both open source builders and contributors, companies who have leveraged open source and build, uh, built on top of it, as well as companies that offer consulting and services around that. A big thanks to all of our partners who have joined with us in this open search software foundation. And now the community, all of you own this project, and the community can help us shape this into becoming the best search and analytics platform in open source. And we are super excited to be partnering with the Linux Foundation um, and leveraging their open source tools, et cetera. And we never forget that the community is our greatest asset, asset, and I hope you will join, all of you will join us in our journey. I thank you all for being here. Please stop by our open search uh, booth downstairs if you want to learn more about open search, but also the open search software foundation. With that, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day here. Thank you, Nandini. It is amazing. 
What exciting news. I, I just Make sure you learn more about Open Search Foundation today. So, switching gears. Oops, I got the right button. Um, as I think about uh, open source projects that, you know, get moved, forked under an open governance, um, it really reminds us, um, you know, why the definition of open source is so important. Um, and really, it brings me to the next level of trust. Um, you know, all eyes are on AI, um, and ensuring it remains open is paramount. Uh, this is not a trivial problem, and one where the Linux Foundation feels uh, that we have a responsibility in you know, helping the open source community in getting this right, and again, build trust on such an important technology. Um, so why is this so complex? Well, first and foremost, AI is not just code. Uh, it's a combination of code, infrastructure, training data, weights. Um, you know, the open source definition as we know it uh, doesn't just apply verbatim. And in fact, the, o the OSI, the Open Source Initiative, has been working now uh, for almost two years uh, to define what open source AI means. Um, not only there's no definition of open source AI, but as we saw before, uh, several models out there uh, are labeling themselves as open source, um, either by misusing the, the legal instruments provided by software licenses, or you know, trying to exploit the, the goodwill the open source brand has been built over the years. Um, you know, open washing is, is nothing new. It's something that the open source community has been familiar with with decades. Uh, but in the case of AI, uh, making sure it's truly open source, uh, you know, has massive economic and societal implications. Um, and this is potentially even more important in Europe. Uh, again, from our report, uh, it's pretty clear that open source is seen as a major opportunity for European economy, uh, where startups are blossoming, open source AI startups. Um, but it's also very much in line with the uh, sort of human-centered vision uh, that technology, that the European Union has around technology. And so uh, I want to quickly touch uh, on one of the efforts uh, that the Linux Foundation, and particularly the Gen AI Commons project, has been undertaking over the last year. Uh, a year ago on this stage, we announced uh, Gen AI Commons, and in you know, a little over six months, they released uh, the model openness framework, uh, offering effectively the first practical way to evaluate models in terms of completeness and openness uh, based on quite established principles of open science. So what's the MOF? Um, you know, just like OSI is working to define the principles behind open source AI, uh, you know, the LFA in data and Gen AI Commons community has been working through each layer that makes up an AI system and what openness looks like at each layer. Um, if you take a model, uh, that consists upward of 15 different building blocks, which you see up there. Um, effectively categorized in either code, data, or documentation. And when you take this approach, then you have a quite granular way of uh, looking at uh, uh, AI through the lenses of open source and through the lenses of the licensing of the various elements and how they interconnect, interconnect with each other uh, to, degree, to determine effectively the degree of openness of that model. So in other words, the MOF doesn't take a binary approach, uh, open or closed. Uh, it rather has a sliding approach um, that really depends on how many correlated elements are being made available under an OSI-approved license. Um, the community has already implemented the MOF uh, through what we call the Model Openness Tool. Um, if you didn't know, there's already 250 models that have been submitted and are at different stages of evaluation. So if you go to isitopen.ai, uh, you can see the MOF in action. Uh, the community is accepting feedback. Uh, Gen AI Commons is open to everyone. We very much encourage uh, you to participate and join uh, the working group calls to help improving the MOF. And so it's not surprising that 
uh, our flagship project in AI, LFAI and data, has seen massive growth in the last year, uh, and it's quickly becoming the home for open source AI. Um, but it's not just LFAI and data. Uh, virtually any project in the Linux Foundation is doing something uh, related to AI. The Finos project that I happen to lead uh, has seen a lot of uptake uh, from financial institutions trying to really embrace uh, Gen AI and build uh, open source uh, Gen AI. Uh, another example is UXL. Uh, we launched last year the Unified Acceleration Foundation uh, to build an open standard for uh, you know, the compute accelerated computing software ecosystem. Uh, again, the compute is a fundamental part of AI. Um, and having an open standard uh, uh, to accelerate the notion and the availability of true open source AI is fundamental. Uh, unsurprisingly, today, one year anniversary, we're seeing a massive uptake on the project. Now, there's going to be extensive content uh, around AI in the next few days, so I'll stop here and switch gears to sort of the last level of uh, uh, trust, uh, which is one near and dear to my heart as I work in Finos. Um, and it's the idea of enabling industries to be first class citizens in open source. Uh, it took years to get banks to contribute. It wasn't, you know, it didn't happen overnight. And there are community of practices like the to-do group, which you're probably familiar with, or we have our own in Finos for uh, enabling regulated industries to contribute and collaborate and build the trust that is needed uh, to become participants of the open source community. Um, and so today, I'm excited to announce a new community of practice, uh, quite similar to the to-do group, but focus on developer relations. This is the Developer Relations Foundation, which has the goal uh, of really elevating the professional practice of developer relations uh, and increase awareness in its role uh, as a crucial driver, not only of developer success, but again, uh, business value. Uh, this is a very exciting effort. So you, if you are in the uh, developer relation function, I exhort you to go to dev-rel.org and get involved. But to put this sort of the impact that industries, traditional industries, so prominent in Europe, um, is having in, in sort of the open source engagement, I want to bring in a, you know, a special guest, a colleague and a friend that I really admire as a pioneer in this space uh, for his work on LF networking. Um, so before I bring on stage Arpit Joshipura, the GM of networking, Edge, and IoT at the Linux Foundation, I also want to send a shout out. I'm excited to announce that Arpit has made the finalist round uh, for the Leading Lights Networking Industry Award uh, for Executive of the Year, based on the impactful work that it's doing to shepherd the industry towards open source for the last several years. So please join me in welcoming Arpit on stage with a big round of applause. All right. Thank you, Gabe. Good morning. So I'm here to announce three things. Uh, and it's all about networking. And I want to make sure that you, know, you understand the background of what networking is. It's very complex. But let me set the stage up. And I'm expecting everybody to know all these projects, right? But give me, give me one minute, and I'll explain, and you'll be the experts. The way you connect is all in this slide, OK? From the left, you start off with access, the various types of access, mobile, 3G, 4G, 5G, 6G, GPON, fiber, you name it, right? You come in, you come to an edge compute area uh, where we have a foundation called LF Edge that unifies frameworks for the different markets of edge, cloud edge, enterprise edge, IoT edge, telecom edge, right? And, and it gives you two implementations of that. So a very exciting project. Then you come on to the main stack, the cloud and the core stack, going all the way from network operating systems like Sonic, like Dent, 
up to the data plane, control plane, automation, and applications. And you, you got to realize that this is a very large uh, ecosystem. So we're going to only announce three things today, but it's important to note that uh, this is the background. So the first piece of news is on Kamara. Kamara is an extremely important project where finally we have figured out how to monetize the richness of a network. The announcement is releasing the first set of APIs that uh, come from the network, globally available, and things like SIM swap, quality of uh, data, quality of uh, connection, right, latency, etc. Uh, in fact, to a point where some of these APIs have been de deployed in companies like Verizon, Deutsche Telekom, for fraud detection, etc. So that's being worked and announced. Along with that, you must have seen a huge announcement on a joint venture that's formed by the top telcos, 12 of them with Ericsson, that basically are solving one simple problem, get the apps to work anywhere. Wouldn't it be nice? Like, we can have a phone call and a text anywhere in the world, but the apps don't work. That's what it's doing. Okay, so that's the first announcement. The second announcement is on packet core. So remember that diagram? On the, on the right-hand side, up top, that's core. Core as in the brains behind making calls, mobile or fixed. So we're pleased to announce that Free 5GC, uh, one of the world's leading open packet core, is now moving to the Linux Foundation under the neutral governance and under you know, uh, the, the organization to provide uh, alternatives to open source deployment. It joins the rest of the systems. Um, you know, we have Magma, we have SD Core, a lot of other uh, open source systems, uh, Packet Core specifically, that allows us to do end-to-end -end solutions through Packet Core. So very excited about that. Um, and then the final announcement, you know, linking back to what Gabe said about AI, right? So the purple stuff is what he talked about. You don't need to read it all, but it's the generic AI, right? Um, the LLMs and all the hype that has just gone on in the last one year, right? It's the generic models, the generic data, and the generic infrastructure, okay? Purple, LFDI, AI and data solves that. For us, what's happening is the next phase of AI is domain specific, okay? So that's whether you call it a hype or call it reality. Domain specific AI is extremely important to all the domains. Now, one of them is telecommunications. And all the light blue stuff on the top and bottom you see on the right hand side is domain specific. So that's infrastructure all the rich data that comes from it, all the domain-specific data sets that you train on. And on top, you have any specific models that you want to fine-tune, whether through you know, uh, fine-tuning or RAG or whatever, and all the applications and the use cases. So that forms what is the next wave of AI, and that's domain-specific telecommunications. We can do the same in energy. We can do the same in edge, et cetera. And so, what we have, and you can read the announcement on lfnetworking.org, is really the uh, projects, the opportunities, and challenges in this. Because you're going to use AI for networking, networking for AI, both use cases. And we have a rich set of intent in the network that needs to move into AI and learning. And then we have projects like Thought, which anonymizes the data for learning. So that's kind of how we see the whole architecture. And we're really excited with these three announcements. Uh, for those of you who are here through Thursday, there are three mini summits, one on Sonic, one on LF Edge, and another one on Silva that you can join. Uh, and with that, I'm going to bring back Gabe. Thank you. Thank you, Arpit. Really exciting stuff. Now, um, I'm going to have to make up for some time, but um, I'm just putting back my Linux Foundation Europe hat on. Uh, and I want to touch on you know, a relatively new uh, sort of frontier for open source uh, when it comes to building trust. Uh, and it's the active engagement of the public sector, not just in terms of consuming uh, open source, I mean, across the world. Uh, under the you know, public money, public code uh, uh, idea, 
consumption has been there. Um, but I think we all are seeing, again, in the idea of this uh, societal and economic value of open source, the public sector uh, um, really starting to participate more actively. And so I think the Linux Foundation has done an amazing job over the years to bring together individuals and, and corporations uh, collaborating in open source. Um, but now we're working hard to ensure that the public sector also has a place in the open, open governance model, which uh, brought us here. Um, you know, over the last year, uh, on both sides of the pond, uh, we've seen projects invite increased participation with the government. Uh, I think about the Open Source Security Foundation partnership with CISA, or the previous year with the White House. Uh, I think about the left networking, uh, uh, partnering with the US government on Open RAN, uh, Open Radio Access Network, the effectively digital infrastructure. Um, but in Europe, um, we're both, you know, in a way, both at EU level and nation state level, uh, the government and the public sector is possibly even more involved uh, in open source. Uh, we took a very active approach through Linux Foundation Europe. Um, not only we are participating to the NGI Commons project uh, to really advise the EU on uh, their next generation internet funding programs, uh, but Linux Foundation Europe is also uh, uh, been invited to participate as the first open source foundation uh, to the multi-stakeholder standardization platform for ICT, uh, along so many uh, standard uh, SDOs. Um, so while, of course, public sector engagement is, is inherently regional, uh, uh, we never lose sight of the global nature of open source. Um, one of the Linux Foundation Europe projects, the Open Wallet Foundation, uh, earlier this year announced a partnership with ITU, the International Telecommunication Union uh, from the UN, to really create a multi-stakeholder platform where both private and public sector can come together to build digital wallet standards, uh, which then would be implemented in open source. Uh, so, Local engagement is important. There are obviously regional sensitivities, uh, but let's not forget that open source needs to stay global. Which brings me to a quick plug for Linux Foundation Europe. Can I get a show of hands? How many of you know that Linux Foundation Europe exists? Oh, yeah. OK, I guess. Yeah, good. Um, more LinkedIn posts. Now, um, <laughs> Uh, if, in case you don't know, uh, we, uh, you know, public and private sector engagement is a, is a big uh, area of focus for us in Linux Foundation Europe, um, which really provides an entry point for the global Linux Foundation platform. Um, it allows us to host projects in Europe where it makes sense, whether it be because there's a strong European uh, participation, uh, because it's aligned with European priorities, or really because it makes sense from a geographical and geopolitical sensitivity standpoint. Uh, and so I want to take a second to send a shout out uh, to the now 173 members, uh, the five projects we host. Uh, and just in case you didn't know, we're hosting our second Linux Foundation Europe Member Summit on Thursday. We're almost out of seats, but if you're interested to participate, just come to our booth and, and we'll see what we can do. Um, and with that, uh, I want to bring uh, in our last walk on. You know, we talked about the critical role uh, of open source in uh, driving economic and societal change. We talked about the need of, of sort of multi-stakeholder collaborations. We talk about trust. Um, well, I cannot think of a better way to top this off uh, than our next announcement. Today, uh, we are announcing the Linux Foundation Decentralized Trust, uh, which is the definitive community for uh, uh, blockchain, DLT, identity, and other cryptographic technologies. It will be the new home for Hyperledger Foundation, Trust over IP uh, Foundation projects. 
So here to tell us more, uh, my good friend and, and fellow Bay Area local, Daniela Barbosa, uh, General Manager of the Center of Technologies at the Linux Foundation. Please join me in welcoming her on stage. Good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to be here in Vienna for Open Source Summit Europe. Uh, my name is Daniela, and this week, actually, I'm celebrating my seventh anniversary at the Linux Foundation. And every single day, I get to see how our Linux Foundation staff and our community really um, mix to our values here at the Linux Foundation of being um, humble, uh, of being helpful and of being hopeful. Um, today, I'm very humbled to announce uh, a new foundation that we just launched today. Um, and it is a foundation that's much needed, I believe, as global economies shift towards a digital first infrastructure. Today, decentralized technologies are really defining how we interact, how we transact, and how we trust in these digital worlds. It is also ushering an era where individuals hold the keys to their own data, identity, and assets. Trust is no longer just an institutional responsibility, but a network's guarantee. And we believe that the future of decentralized technologies is open source that is openly developed and openly governed at a neutral foundation like the Linux Foundation. So it is my pleasure to announce to you the launch today of LF Decentralized Trust. And as Gab said, it is a new organization that's a combination of existing Linux Foundation projects and new projects that I'll be talking to you about that is really focused on decentralized systems and technologies. When we talk about decentralized technologies, we're talking about blockchains and distributed ledgers and smart contracts, decentralized file storage and identity systems, zero knowledge proofs, and much more. And it's a very exciting time for our new projects and our new communities here at the Linux Foundation. The impact of decentralized technologies is no doubt happening. It's rapidly shaping markets and disrupting traditional business models and systems, many of you working on these things. It is modernizing core infrastructure across finance, trade, government, healthcare, and more. And the opportunities are great. Just in asset tokenization alone, uh, predicted a $16 trillion market cap by the end of 2030, and many say it would be much higher than that. Here at the Linux Foundation, we have a growing ecosystem of projects that is building on more than eight years of projects and communities and maintainers at the Hyperledger Foundation and at Trust Over IP and all the members of the Linux Foundation that's been supporting us. Plus, we have new projects that I'll be announcing today in communities. Since 2015, at the Linux Foundation, the Hyperledger Foundation has been the home for blockchain and digital identity projects, starting with Hyperledger Fabric, and today we just announced Fabric version 3.0 that has some great enhancements that our maintainers from companies like IBM and Hitachi have been working very hard on to increase performance and to also release a new consensus BFT consensus module. As we grew and as we expanded with new projects around identity, like Indian Aries, uh, who run digital identity projects worldwide, we also have one of the top three uh, Ethereum mainnet execution clients with Bezu running 15% of the Ethereum mainnet today as an execution client, in addition to many private permissioned tokenization projects around the world. We have labs and top and uh, uh, projects on interoperability, and we are happy to include Trust Over IP, a JDF, a joint development fund project that since 2020 has really been building on digital trust at internet scale for architecture. And this is a, our first a JDF project in the Linux Foundation Decentralized Trust. We have uh, 
many other projects that are really shaping the world today. And today, September 16th, 2024, I'm pleased to announce our newest project called Loch Ness, which is a new open source ecosystem focused on key management and digital signature protocols, contributed by a company called Defense, with already a working contributor list that also has key cryptographer, academic cryptographers from around the world. And the spectrum of blockchains is all. We've since the start have understood that there's not one blockchain to rule them all, that there's permissioned and permissionless blockchain use cases in the enterprise around the world. And I'm happy today to announce our newest project, Hyro. Hyro is an open source distributed ledger, and it is one of the first public blockchain layer ones that has contributed its entire code to a neutral organization like the Linux Foundation. So we're very excited about Hyro, which is coming to us from the Hedera ecosystem, and the co-founder of Hedera will be coming on to give you an overview of Hyro and the community that we're building here at LF Decentralized Trust around Hyro. We are fueling the future of decentralized technologies. Companies like Siemens and Visa that have helped and supported the Hyperledger Foundation since 2016 have become founding members of LF Decentralized Trust. New members, for example, like Polygon, a public layer one uh, company, um, and Tata Consulting Services have also joined LF Decentralized Trust to support our mission. We have central banks as founding members, some of the largest ones in the world, and today we announced the Central Bank of Brazil as our newest associate member in central bank ecosystems. So now we have hundreds of members and associates that are supporting LF Decentralized Trust. Today we announced 13 new members, including a new premier member to help support the growth of Linux Foundation Decentralized Trust, with Hedera joining our governing board council. We are continue to be community driven and we're building upon the thousands and hundreds of thousands of participants worldwide that support our communities on our projects, really building collaboration in places like India where we have over 15,000 participants in our meetups communities. We are growing landscape of decentralized technologies. These are all the projects that we have today. And keep out, uh, an eye out for new projects coming soon as well. And if you are also working on decentralized technologies and you have projects that you think would be a good fit for D, uh, LF Decentralized Trust, please come and see us. We'd love to talk to you. I invite you all to join LF Decentralized Trust and have a seat at the table as we shape the future of decentralized technologies around the world. Join the community, the maintainers, and the members who have been supporting and will continue to support our efforts. And join us in, as for all members, in San Francisco on October 23rd and 24th um, at the San Francisco Mint, where they used to print old money. We'll be talking about new digital money and new digital transformation with decentralized technologies as well. So welcome to Decentralized Trust, the newest umbrella at the Linux Foundation that is bringing trust to the ecosystem. And without further ado, I want to thank everybody, and I'd like to introduce Lehman Baird, who is the co-founder of Hedera and Hashgraph. He's also a new member of the Technical Steering Committee of our newest project, Hyro. Lehman?